Hi, this is Miss Litton. Happy New Year. This is my wonderful period three AP bio class. Say hi. Hello. Hi. Don't worry. Okay, um, so chapter 20, viruses, bacteria, and archaea. Which of these have we already studied? Bacteria and archaea, we have already studied. We haven't done a lot with viruses. We have talked a little bit about viruses, and this is one of the early experiments for identifying DNA as our hereditary material. What experiment was that? Her what? Hershey and Chase. And what did Hershey and Chase work with? Bacteriophage. Yeah, bacteria, bacteriophage or phage, that's fine. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about that, but, but not a ton about it. Because we have talked about bacteria and archaea, if you scroll to the end of the group shared notes, I have a prolific summary. And the, what? Okay. And the reason why I did that is I'm including material that we have studied in previous chapters about bacteria and archaea. And I'm just putting it all together, and this is like our summative of the, of the topic, okay? So anyway, that's why that is um, so long there at the end, all right? Um, the other thing I want to address is these chapters in this unit, after we leave viruses, bacteria, archaea, we move into plants, and there are several topics we don't need to discuss in them. So that's why you see next time I've com combined chapter 23 and 24, and those 23, 24 notes are actually less than this chapter's notes right here. And that's why I anticipate us finishing these notes up next class and then doing 23 and 24 um, together. All right, um, so we're gonna start. Um, you can see these are uh, bacteria and viruses, obviously much smaller than bacteria. Are viruses alive? No, they're not alive. Do you, um, um, do you know how viruses replicate? They have to use other cells to replicate. Okay, good. So we're going to go through and um, talk about um, viruses. And here are just a bunch of different shapes um, and, and sizes of viruses. Um, they have two things always in common. All viruses have two things in common. They have a nucleic acid core, and we'll get to the notes part of this in just a minute, a nucleic acid core and a protein capsid. They may or may not have an envelope on top of that cap capsid that they pick up from their host cell. Their nucleic acid core could be DNA or RNA. It could be single-stranded. It could be double-stranded. We'll look into that in just a minute. Here you can see a picture for scale and size. You have a bacterium here on the left. Um, here is chlamydia. That's also um, bacterium. And hopefully you never get chlamydia. It's one of the most common um, sexually transmitted diseases in women. Um, Pox virus, herpes virus, influenza, um, polio. Herpes virus. Now, I have herpes. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm so glad I said, not genital, but I get cold sores. Have we talked about that before? No. So do you think, do, now, they're, they're contagious. Do you think I kissed somebody who had a big old cold sore on their mouth? No. Do you think I shared a drink with somebody who had a cold sore on their mouth? No, that would gross me out. Okay, I'd be like, God, oh, you have a sore, okay? The problem is when some viruses are contagious, when you get that, is when, before they actually have an outbreak, before they have a cold sore on their mouth. And so I was married for 19 years, never gave that cold sore to my husband in all 19 years. And I kissed him a whole bunch, okay? But the reason is because whenever I could tell I was going to get a cold sore, then um, I, I wouldn't kiss him because it's before you can actually see it. What, what danger is in that? What do you see? What could, have, what could have happened? What could people do when they're transmitting a virus? Could they do it unknowingly? Could they do it willfully? Yes. Could I have given that to him? Yeah, I could have. Okay. Now, that's just a, a cold sore on your lip, which is easy medicine, you can take, it's fine. I can't imagine, because cold sores, if you get them, they're, they hurt. I cannot imagine having one of those here. That, to me, would be like atrociously painful. Once again, when you could transmit it, 
is not when it's ever even showing. Because I am betting if you decide at some point when you're mature and you are at a different point than now in high school, okay? No, whoops, I slipped and fell on a penis, okay? <laughs> that if you saw something that had sores all over it, you would go, no. You know, and so, but the problem is, is you can pick up these STDs when there is no sore that is evident. Okay, something to consider. Have you talked about this in your health class? Do I need to show you gross pictures? Mm -hmm. Okay, because you, you know that I have some? I do. <laughs> <laughs> not today, not in today's a lecture. Now, do I constantly have a cold sore on my lip? No, so why don't I constantly have a cold sore on my lip then, if I, if I have that? What? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't treat it, I don't treat it on any kind of daily basis at all. What? My body can hold it back. There are times when viruses um, will kind of come out of hiding, is what they do. And the herpes virus stays at the end of your nerve endings. And certain things can stimulate it to come out, for instance, sun. So that's why sometimes if, they, if somebody's been outside in the sun a lot and they do get um, cold sores, it's the sun that triggers it, or maybe really acidic food. So I always have sunscreen for my lips because I don't like to get cold sores. It's uncomfortable and it's ugly, to be quite frank. So I always put um, lip balm on in order to prevent that. So something can stimulate it to come out of hiding. What is a horrible virus that can lay in hiding for years and years and years and it is sexually transmitted? HIV. HIV. So HIV can stay in hiding. People can be sexually active and pass that virus around and not even, they could be aware of it, they decide they, they want the sex more than they want to risk their partner telling them they won't have sex with them, so they go ahead and end up transmitting it in some way. And it will lay latent and then some st something happens where you have to have an immune response to some disease, sickness, pathogen, and that triggers it to leave its latency and come out. And so we'll talk about how viruses go in and out in their different types of life cycles. Okay, so first off, we want to start, um, here's a picture of crystallized swine flu virus. Now, this part should be scary, because a virus isn't alive. So if you can crystallize it, you could store it and send it to a friend, okay? And that is some concern, and it has been concerns in the past, that if you could make it into a powder that you then ingest and breathe in, then you could pass that along um, in a very evil way. Okay, you could pass that to others. There are some virus particles that maybe were found in rat droppings that degraded and they become powder and then you go up and you sweep and you put the powder into the air and then you end up breathing it into your lungs and you can pick up a virus in that way too. Okay, so they're not alive. So as long as their nucleic acid and protein um, capsid is still intact, it can get into your system and then infect a host cell and then go from there, okay? Some viruses would expose, like HIV, if it's exposed to oxygen um, in the environment, like if blood is sitting out like on a counter or something, not like blood should be, but if it was, um, the oxygen kind of um, disables it so that you can't um, get it from that usually. It doesn't mean, oh, you can go and you know, roll in it, but you, you, you shouldn't be able to pick it up, but some you can. Um, okay, so what I want to do first is ping pong back and forth. Slate, you are the virus. Um, blue, you are the prokaryote, the bacteria. Ping pong back and forth, role play. So I'm a virus, and I'm not. Okay, and just go back and forth. Go ahead. All right, let's go to your group shared notes. What is a virus? A microscopic pirate. It is associated with disease. It is host specific. Host specific. They are obligate intracellular parasites. They have nucleic acids which can evolve, but they require a host to replicate. 
a host to replicate. They have no metabolism or other characteristics of life. Okay, where did viruses come from? There's a couple hypotheses. One is they could have evolved before our three domain system. Lou, could you please tell them the three domains? Could you also tell a differentiating characteristic for each one of those domains? Go ahead. Okay. A second option is that it, because they're host specific, maybe they evolved from a spe specific host after they um, already um, had evolved into being. For instance, the tobacco mosaic virus only affects tobacco plants. You would not get sick like, oh, I came down with tobacco mosaic virus. You couldn't, okay? Because it, um, their gateway into cells are very host specific. Now, if you look here, there are things that they have to have, okay? They have to have some sort of nucleic acid, DNA, RNA, single or double stranded. They may and usually have at least one enzyme that they're packaged with, some protein enzyme, that helps them gain um, access to the cellular machinery that they're gonna take over. Um, they for sure have a protein capsid over the top of them, um, and they may or may not have an outer envelope. An outer envelope is very typical of animal viruses because the way viruses get out of our cells is they bud, they bud out. So they, they go like this and they in, and come out of the cell and over their protein capsid is some of our own cell membrane. The advantage to that is they become a wolf in sheep's clothing in our body then because they have what looks like one of our own cell membranes around them and they know the secret knock to get into our cells, okay? Now, they can have their viral spikes that are on there as well, um, and, and those can be recognized by our immune system to take care of us, but they also have the ability to attach to our own body cells. They send us the right signal, and we're like, oh, come in, come in, and we engulf them, and then they take over. Um, so that would be very typical, having an envelope of an animal um, virus. They're classified by the type of nucleic acid they have, their size, their shape um, help classify them, and whether or not they have an outer envelope. So on your notes, size and shape, type of nucleic acid, and if there is an outer envelope, they have virally encoded protein spikes that allow them to gain entry to a cell, gain entry to a cell. So when you look at their structure, okay, um, you will see an outer protein capsid. The protein capsid in this picture is green for this. This is an adenovirus um, with its nucleic acid core. This is a bacteriophage. You've seen one of those before. They only infect bacteria. <coughs> this is the tobacco mosaic virus. And here you can see it's an RNA virus. You can see the RNA inside. This right here is an example of influenza. This is like if you got it, the flu. And in the center here, the, the red is the RNA, the green is the protein capsid, and the orange is the envelope it picked up when it exited one of our body cells. So on your structure, you just needed to add outer protein capsid. I think I gave you everything else for that. Okay, and then this is showing you um, the different types of nucleic acid, SSDNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, it could be RNA, it could be the sense strand, um, or not. Here, answer me this question. As you're packing, B-I-G, another one, Y-G, Y-G, we're done Y-G, oh, yeah, B-C-D, not colored, did somebody put that, oh, somebody did, how embarrassing, 
Let's see who won. <laughs> oh, ghost face killer. Is that Michael? <laughs> yeah, that's Michael. Michael was a comeback. G Easy. Yep. Oh, Michael. <laughs> Doctor, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Dre, Chris Brown. Hi. Hi. Okay, good job. You get to go home. Go. No, what are you blaming? Oh, Who is Barry? Go home. Go home. Go home. Why is this such a long game today? Because you're hitting all your classes. Yeah, I know.